given that cosecant of three theta is negative one. On the interval from zero to 360 degrees. <clears throat> uh, so, a couple things that we would have to look at with this. If I know that the interval for theta is from zero to 360 degrees, that means that 3 theta is going to be between 0 and 3 times 360, so 180. So the same as 6 pi? Yeah, it is the same as 6 pi. <clears throat> so I'm going to have to look for all the answers that correspond to when is cosecant equal to negative 1 on that interval. So cosecant of something is equal to negative one when one over sine of that something is equal to negative one, which just means when sine of that something is negative one, because the reciprocal of negative one is just going to be negative one. So I'm looking for where sine of 3 theta is negative 1, um, or basically not where sine of 3 theta, but where sine is equal to negative 1 on the interval between 0 and 1,080 degrees. So between 0 and 360, the one that we would normally think about, sine is equal to negative 1 for what? Yeah, 270 degrees. That's the first one on the normal unit circle. But again, we changed the, the domain that we're looking over, over. So I need to also know where is that the second time around and the third time around since we're going around three times that unit circle. Now that's the only place that it's equal to negative one. I'd have to look for two different ones there and then add 360 or anything like that. But the coterminal angle between, say, 360 and 720 is just going to be 270 plus 360. Uh, 40. 30? Yeah, 630. Yeah, and yeah. then the one between 720 and 1080 is going to be 630 plus 360. So 990 degrees. Addition came up short today. So I've got each of these based on the fact just that sine of whatever angle we're looking at was equal to negative one, and the fact that our our original domain for theta is zero to three hundred and sixty degrees. So our domain for three theta has to be zero to, to one thousand eighty. And then I want to make sure I solved here for that angle that we're taking sine of. So I solved for three theta there. That means I still need to solve for theta by dividing all three of those answers that we just got by three. So that our final answer for this is actually gives me a theta that's between zero and 360. So 270 divided by three, is gonna be 90, 630 divided by three, 210, 990, Divided by three would be 330 degrees. Yeah, you'd end up with more than you would need if you did, if you added 180. The one problem with that, so, um, I'll bring up for that one, since in the example it, it had you add 180 there. The problem with that is that that one would have been for, say, any angle except one of the quadrantal angles. So if it was equal to negative one half or square root of three over two. Uh, but since sine is only equal to negative one in one place, 
on the unit circle, then where then if we add 180 degrees, it's not equal to negative one anymore there. So that would be one of the differences. All right. Find those three and make sure we plug in correctly. Just in case. Any others? Okay, I got a phone number. Well, phone number 15. Uh, I got it all the way down to the uh, the cosecant 2 of x equals 8 over 17, but it's asking us to do the calculator, so I'm not really sure what my what you know if I do I need to do I need to convert that cosine 2 x into something else or is that a final? I'm not sure how to get the number 15. You said yeah. I mean I got the answer. I mean you can, if you want to work the whole problem out, you can. But I've, sure. I've, I've I mean I've already got the I don't know, the only part I understand is how to input it into the calculator. And you, like you said, we were, you know, have no question like that on the test, but I just don't right. know how to do it. So 15 at tangent, tangent of 2x plus secant of 2x equals 5. Is that about what you have? Uh, well, the one I have here is 4. Okay. Or, yeah, there's just a couple of different options I have. 2x. I'll use five so okay. I can plug it in. At yeah. least. <laughs> um, but tangent of 2x plus secant of 2x equal to 5 um, on the interval from 0 to 2 pi. Not including 2 pi. I have to remind myself to bring the black dry erase markers that I have so that I can use these in the room now. Um, if I'm going to use this, and I'm going to solve for x here. First thing that I want to do is what? You want to get the, you want to get a uh, uh, equation that you can use a Pythagorean identity. Yes, I'd like to get it to where I can use a Pythagorean identity. I really the main thing to to say about this is that I want to have a a single trig function. Um, hopefully in this case 2x, but it could be, I mean, we could use a double angle identity and get 4x or a half angle and get x. We could do that, but I want a single trig function um, that I can use to figure out what these angles are going to be. So in order to do that, since I have tangent and secant here, we're going to do kind of like that example. towards the end um, of the lesson. I'm going to subtract one of them. It doesn't matter if it's tangent or if it's secant because we're going to do essentially the same process. Uh, subtract one of those trig functions from both sides and that way I can square both sides of the equation. tangent squared of 2x is equal to 5 minus secant of 2x quantity squared. I need to make sure that I take this, multiply it by itself. So I'm going to end up with tangent squared of 2x. This will be 25 minus 5 secant at 2x minus 5 secant 2x. So minus 10 secant of 2x and then plus secant squared of 2x, right? And to kind of save a line, I'm going to go ahead and rewrite the tangent squared of 2x over here in terms of secant. So write secant squared of 2x minus 1. By our definition, again, I think this was the exact one that was used in the, the example problem on the notes, but secant squared of whatever is equal to tangent squared of that whatever plus one. So tangent squared would just be secant squared minus one. All right. And then from here, I'm going to simplify. I know that I can cancel out secant squared terms because I can subtract them from both sides. I, I did say last time, and this still applies, 
don't divide out an answer that has the X term or theta or whatever it is in it, that still applies because we can lose a solution from that. But if we're subtracting the same value from both sides, that's okay if those terms end up canceling out that way. That doesn't lose us any solutions when we do that. All right, and then add one to both sides. So I end up with, actually, I'm not gonna add one. Well, yes, I am. I'm gonna add one and then add 10 secant of two X. It'd be a cleaner problem without the negative, right? Yeah, that's that's the reason I'm doing it that way instead. I mean, you could you could subtract 25 from both sides and and then just both of them negative. would be negative and then multiply by negative one. I have 10 secant of two X equals 26 secant of two X is equal to 26 over 10 or 13 over five, right? I'm gonna use that fact I'm looking for the value of X here. If I want to just figure out what this value is going to be, if I can, yeah, around the four decimal places that we have, this isn't going to be one of our, our nice trig values. It would be a nice, uh, it'd be a nice triangle to set up because it'd be a 5, 12, 13, but that's not what we're looking for. So in this case, I'm gonna rewrite this as cosine of two X equal to five over 13 instead. And then I also wanna note that since X is between zero and two pi, two X is gonna be between zero and four pi. Okay. So to find these possible values, I know, first of all, even actually before I write this part, I should probably have said, Cosine is going to be 5 thirteenths in which quadrants? It's going to be in the first quadrant because it's positive and also in the third. Yeah. Cosine will be positive in the first and the fourth quadrant. Yeah. All right, so I know this answer right here, I know this is going to give me an answer in first quadrant, fourth quadrant. I need to find both of those. And then I'm also going to have to figure out the coterminal angles because we're going from zero to four pi instead of zero to two pi. I'll just add two pi to each of those. All right. I also know here when I take the inverse cosine of five thirteenths, that is only going to give me an answer in which of those quadrants. Because inverse cosine only exists for which two. Inverse <laughs> cosine is valid in which two quadrants? One and two. Yeah, first and the second one. So when I take the inverse cosine of a positive value, this is only going to give me the first quadrant answer. It's the only one I'm going to have. I should probably label these. This one's only going to give me an answer in the first quadrant. That's the only thing that the, the calculator is going to be able to give us. We're going to have to find that one that we know is in the fourth quadrant. Again, I know that cosine is 5 thirteenths. Let's see, 5, yeah. 5 thirteenths in the first quadrant there, but also in the fourth quadrant. So I'm going to have to find both of those and then also add 2 pi to each of them to get the ones from 0 to 4 pi. So what are you doing your, on these? Do you, are you, you suggest graphing? Uh, at least maybe plotting just to get a decent idea of, of which angles we're looking for and where they are so that we know kind of how to get to whatever point we're at. 
So whatever this comes out to, whatever inverse cosine of 5 thirteenths is, my other answers for this to get this angle in the fourth quadrant. I'm going to take this angle that I just found, because that's going to be my reference angle, and I'm going to do what with it? How do I get... How do I get that angle? If I know the reference angle, if I know the, the one in the first quadrant. Subtract it? Yeah, subtract that angle from... 360? 360 or... So whatever I get for that first that first value, and again we'd have to plug into a calculator and rounding rounding it to four decimal places. But my second answer, the one that's again in the fourth quadrant, is two pi minus that answer because that's our reference angle. And then remember our new. Our new domain is from 0 to 4 pi instead of 0 to 2 pi, so I'm going to take each of these answers that I just found and just add 2 pi to each of them. So, I have cosine inverse 5 thirteenths plus 2 pi. Again, that gives me this exact same angle that I started with, just, you know, one more rotation. And then 2 pi minus inverse cosine of 5 thirteenths plus 2 pi. Right? Basically treating that angle that I just found as its own angle. All right. And you could simplify that to be 4 pi minus that. It'd be fine. All right. Those are the four values. Again, whatever you get, I don't have my, I mean, I don't have a calculator on it. It doesn't really matter. About the yours, yours might be different. Um, if you have four, then it's different. Huh? I mean, the other thing is that the question depended on the, you being able to put it into the calculator on the homework. Yeah, so well, it said, it said, um, it so, said round to four decimal places. So what were, so would I, would I type in the cosine yeah, negative one five exactly. plus two pi? I mean, or, and, yeah, type, type inverse cosine 5 thirteenths and then plus 2 pi and then round that, that to four decimal places. Now, right, the yeah. one other thing that we have to do to make sure of here is that I solve for 2x, so I have to divide everything that we just did here by x, or by 2. So whatever one half that is, don't forget to do that. And whatever one half of the second one is, So would that be in radian mode? Yeah, be in radian mode, mode, yeah. Right. Whatever one half of the third one is, whatever one half of the fourth one is. So don't forget that we solved for 2x there. Make sure that happens. All right. The last thing I need to do is to remember, which I can't kind of scroll back through this because it was on the whiteboard and it's erased. But remember that we squared both sides of the equation when we started to solve for this so that I could use that identity. Make sure to plug in this first answer, the second one, the third one, the fourth one into the original equation and see if they actually come up with um, a true equation. If it actually makes tangent of 2x plus secant of 2x equal to 5 in this case. All right. So... almost certainly by squaring both sides of the equation, we actually added solutions to what we have. So make sure to plug them back in because all four of those answers that I get when I take each of these divided by two, all four of those are likely not to be um, answers that will work as a solution. Probably just two of them really would be my guess. All right. Then let's see. So 
day, we finish up chapter six uh, by talking about equations involving inverse trigonometric functions, right? Which we kind of just did, like we used inverse trig functions, but now we're going to have equations that start with those uh, along the way, right? So we'll solve for say x in terms of y or a variable in terms of another variable using inverse trig functions and then we'll solve actual inverse trig equations so that you know we can get exact values or hopefully at least exact values so we'll start off pretty simple with these <coughs> if i want to solve y equals three cosine of two x for x as long as x is on the interval between 0 and pi over 2, then pretty straightforward what I need to do. Again, I'm solving, I'm just solving for x, so I'm trying to get that all by itself. I'm going to do whatever operations I need to do to get the x term all by itself. All right, first thing, since I have y equals 3 cosine of 2x, I'm going to divide both sides by 3. So I get y over 3 equal to cosine of 2x. And if I'm trying to find x and it's inside that cosine term, then I need to cancel that cosine term out. So the inverse operation for cosine is going to be inverse cosine or arc cosine. I'm going to do that to both sides of the equation. So I'm going to have that 2x, the inverse cosine of cosine of 2x is just 2x. And that'll be equal to the inverse cosine or the arc cosine of y over 3. All right? So take arc cosine of both sides. By definition, that's what we have. And then the last thing to solve for x is just divide both sides by 2 or multiply by a half. So we get that x is equal to 1 half arc cosine of y over 3. We've solved for that. The one thing, the one other thing that we want to at least make sure of here, because I solved for x and I got that it is a an inverse trig equation here, I want to make sure that it still corresponds to a valid equation or a valid function that we're dealing with. So I'm also going to look at, make sure we note the original, where I have y equals 3 cosine of 2x has a period of pi. Remember, 2 pi divided by b, so 2 pi over 2 is just pi. So the original one has a period of pi. Shows kind of the graph of it there. Since we limited x to be between 0 and pi over 2 here, then that just means I'm going from the maximum value it can have to the minimum value it can have. And therefore, we're only on a, a stretch of this function a particular interval of this function where it actually is one-to-one, -one, all right? I don't have two different y values corresponding to, uh, or sorry, the same y value corresponding to two different x values in that case. It passes the horizontal line test. The horizontal line is only gonna go through at most one point on that interval from zero to pi over two. Right? And that's why it needed to be restricted from the beginning. But it's always a good idea to check and make sure that our answer here at least is valid. Or if it didn't give us that restriction to start with, we would have to say once we got to this point, okay, where is this going to be valid for? It's going to be valid on 0 to pi over 2. Or if you prefer pi over 2 to pi or any interval where it's 1 to 1. All right. So simple enough, we're using the definition of that inverse trig function or the arc trig function just to solve for a value that's inside of one of the original trig functions, All right? Let's say now I want to solve um, the equation 2 arc sine of x equal to pi. Again, pretty simple. Solving that, that means I need to get the variable all by itself if there's a variable there. So I need to figure out what x is equal to. I'm going to divide both sides by 2 since that's the coefficient out in front of the arc sine function. 
And then to solve for X, again, basically by definition, if arc sine of X is pi over two, take sine of both sides and it cancels out the arc sine function. So I'm just gonna have X is equal to sine of pi over two. And sine, sine of pi over two is equal to what? Four is equal to one. <coughs> Plug that in just to check. I mean, two arc sine of one. I want to make sure that's equal to pi. Arc sine of one is pi over two. It's where is sine equal to one? So two times pi over two is equal to pi. relatively simple when we have something easy given that way. Let's say we start complicating this, then the solution set would be one. Say we complicate this a little bit. I'm looking to solve inverse cosine of X equal to inverse sine of one half. One thing we can remember here is that when we first talked about those inverse trig functions, we had um, certain situations, really when we had the sum functions where the sum or difference identities that we were using, where we would take the sign of, you know, inverse cosine of pi over six plus inverse tangent of pi over four or something like that, where we know, I can already say right now that inverse sine of one half represents a what? Inverse sine of one half represents what? Generally, not what is it equal to or anything like that, but generally it represents what? Also inverse cosine of, of X represents what? I take the inverse trig function of a value. It is essentially finding an Quadrant angle? Angle, yeah. I'm just looking for an angle. So inverse sine of one half is an angle. Inverse cosine of X is an angle. And we don't know what that one's gonna be. But remember that those, technically, those are what those stand for. So always make sure we can treat them that way. So first thing I'm gonna do is just let inverse sine of one half be equal to U. It's just an angle U in this case, all right? And that means sine of u is equal to one half. Since that's positive, I know that it's got to be in the first quadrant because inverse sine is valid in the first and the fourth. It's positive in the first one, it's negative in the fourth one. All right. <coughs> Bless you. So we're looking in the first quadrant. Remember that part. I'm just going to solve that equation there. If I have inverse cosine of X is inverse sine of one half, that means inverse cosine of X is U because that's what we let U be equal to. And I'm just gonna solve for X by taking the cosine of both sides. So X is equal to cosine of U. And now I just have to actually figure out what is cosine of U or cosine of that angle inverse sine of one half. Right. But I can figure that out again. If inverse sine of one half is u, then sine of u is one half. So I know it's in the first quadrant. I can just set that up. The opposite side is one. The hypotenuse is two. I know in this case, this is one of those special triangles, but I can use the Pythagorean theorem to get the adjacent side and just have two squared minus one squared, take the square root of it. I'll get the square root of three. But remember this triangle is represented that, that hypotenuse is along the angle U, that reference angle that we were given. Because again, inverse sine of one half is U, so sine of U is one half. It's gotta be in the first quadrant because that's the only place where inverse sine is positive. So that's where we get this triangle from. And remember, all I was looking for was X is equal to cosine of U. So what's cosine of U? Adjacent side over hypotenuse. So square root of three over two. Is 
this a 30 degree angle? And yeah, in this case, it'd be a 30 degree angle. All right. So treat these inverse trig functions or arc trig functions as angles. Make sure we know, you know, what quadrant they're in, what it tells us about the adjacent side, the opposite side, the hypotenuse, and what else we can figure out about them. Uh, and then just go from there. If I'm just trying to figure out what X is, I know X is cosine of the angle. So find cosine of the angle that we just established based on all that other information. All right? Questions on any of those? Relatively straightforward. Yeah, um, there's only one more example here, but it gets a bit more complicated because it adds a lot of different stuff to this. Um, so we'll make sure we're clear on this stuff, or especially this one, because this will kind of come back here. Good deal. All right, last example then, relatively short lesson today. Solve arc sine of x minus arc cosine of x equal to pi over 6. We're going to have to look at a few different things here. We can't be sure of everything at the start. But much like with that last homework problem, if I have, um, if I have that trig function, in this case the inverse trig function or the arc trig function of an angle, and I have another one, another arc trig function of that angle, I want to isolate at least one of them on one side. Okay, so I'm going to try to get the arc, uh, let's say arc sine of x, because it's easy to just add arc cosine of x to both sides. All right, but I'm going to isolate one of them, whichever one you choose. I'm choosing arc sine. So add arc cosine of x to both sides. You get that arc sine of x is equal to arc cosine of x plus pi over 6. All right. We'll come back to this in a second. That's why it's labeled um, as equation one. And again, I know that our cosine of X is, is just an angle. I could call that one U if I needed to. But if I want to solve for X, I'm just going to take the sine of both sides to cancel out that arc sine function. So we get that X is equal to sine of and then this entire side, arc cosine of x plus pi over 6, all in parentheses. Which again is a total angle. This is this is some angle and then plus some angle pi over 6. If I take sine of it, I can use one of the uh, sum identities. Sine of a plus b is sine a cosine b plus cosine a sine b. I can use that, figure it out from there. All right. <coughs> What I need to do next, though, is figure out where this is going to be, where this angle for our cosine is going to be, because that's going to dictate how I take the sine of it when we do that. Right? So just like we did before, I'm going to let that unknown part, in this case, the, the arc cosine of x, I'm going to let that be equal to u. Just call it angle u. I know it stands for an angle. By definition, arc cosine, I know I already says there, but arc cosine is only valid. It only gives us angles in the first and the second quadrant, all right, from zero to pi. I don't know which one it is yet. We haven't been given any other information beyond that. Here's the other thing I know, though. I'm going to try to figure out, because again, I basically want to find this triangle that corresponds to this and then take sine of that sum function, that, that sum identity. I know u is in the first or the second quadrant. I also know that arc sine of x is equal to arc cosine of x plus pi over 6. Arc sine of x is in which two quadrants? One, four. Same one and four. It's from negative pi over two to pi over two. So I'm going to use again that first equation, that equation one right there, and the definition of arc sine. All right. I know that arc 
cosine of x plus pi over 6. Remember, that was what arc sine was equal to. So if arc sine of x is arc cosine of x plus pi over 6, that means arc cosine of x plus pi over 6 has to be between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2. All right? Just by definition, I'm substituting what we're given in the problem, the arc cosine x plus pi over 6 part, for arc sine of x there. But that's in and the, then I'm just going to subtract pi over 6 from That's those. in the asymptotes. It's not on a circle. Ah, uh, yes. Yeah. It's not like this way to this way. Oh, no, no. It would be, uh, it'd be yes, on the even circle. Well, negative pi, negative over two pi, pi over 2. Pi over 2. Yeah. Okay. And then subtract pi over 6 from both or from every term. And I get that our cosine of x is between negative 2 pi over 3 and positive pi over 3. The reason we're looking at this, again, notice I already figured out where our cosine of x was. It's between 0 and pi. That's by definition. But I also know from the other information that it's between negative 2 pi over 3 and pi over 3. Well, that means I have two intervals for our cosine of x. My answer is going to have to correspond to where those two overlap. All right? So I know two things about our cosine of x between 0 and pi and between negative 2 pi over 3 and pi over 3. I have to find just the overlapping interval. All right. So since it's between 0 and pi and it's between negative 2 pi over 3 and pi over 3, the only place where those two overlap is between 0 and pi over 3. All right. And the reason it's important for us to figure that out, based on everything we've done, is because I know I have one interval that goes From 0 to pi, that's my normal, you know, arc cosine of x. Cosine of x is between 0 and pi. We knew that part, that's just by definition. And then the other one that we have there was negative 2 pi over 3 to pi over 3. So I was given, again, two definitions. They're both arc cosine of x. So I have to figure out this one spot, or not one spot, but this overlapping interval that I have right there between the two of them, where they're going to coincide with each other since both of these definitions are for our cosine of x, I can only have the smallest interval where they both apply. All right? So our cosine of x has to be between a positive pi over 3 and 0. All right? That's what we're finding. Again, all of this, I know that's a lot of stuff to say about this, but the most important thing that we're looking at here and, and trying to determine is which quadrant is our answer going to be in. In this case, that tells us our, our answer is in the first quadrant. That means I can use that information to establish the, the triangle that we're going to use, the opposite side, adjacent side, hypotenuse, all of that. All it means is our answer is going to be in the first quadrant. All right, it's not in the first and the fourth or the fourth, or even in this case, the third one. It's not in the second one. It's in the overlap, so it's got to be in the first quadrant. That is the main thing to take away from that. 
using that information to determine which quadrant our angle is going to be in. All right. So that means you is in the first quadrant. Perfect. Now I can do everything we would normally do from there. All right. I know that X is equal to sine of U plus pi over six, which was again, our cosine of X there. So I can use a sum identity, like I said a second ago, sine of A plus B is sine of A cosine B plus cosine A sine B. That means sine of U plus pi over six is sine of U cosine pi over six plus cosine U sine pi over six. I know what cosine of pi over six is. That's just square root of three over two. I know sine of pi over six is gonna be one half. I just need to figure out what sine of u and cosine of u are gonna be equal to. All right, I actually already know what cosine of u is equal to because we told ourselves what it's gonna be equal to. Cosine of u is gonna be equal to x because u is our cosine of x, all right? But again, I need to figure out sine u, cosine u from this. I'm going to go back to our definition. I'm going to go back to that part I just said right here. If u is arc cosine of x, that means cosine of u is just equal to x. Or in this case, I could also say cosine of u is equal to x over 1. I'm going to use this definition. I'm going to use the fact that I know it's in the first quadrant. And I'm going to plug into this once I figure out what it's equal to. So here's what that's going to look like in this case. If cosine of u is x or x over 1, the adjacent side is x, the hypotenuse is 1. Solve for the opposite side. All right. I'm going to take the square root of one squared minus x squared. So it's just square root of one minus x squared. Use the Pythagorean theorem there. I get that the opposite side is square root of one minus x squared. So sine of this angle is opposite over hypotenuse. Square root of one minus x squared over one is just the square root of one minus x squared. All right. Again, I want to emphasize because I know these the it's hard to do with slides. Like maybe if I wrote it out, I could set it up in like three different places and we could kind of call it that. It'd still be difficult. Remember, we're calling back to get this triangle. This triangle is solely based off of our substitution from the beginning. It is it's based exactly off of the fact that we let you that angle be equal to our cosine of x. So cosine of u is x or x over one that's where that triangle comes from and i happen to know that it's in the first quadrant because of all the other stuff we did earlier so find sine of u and then now i'm just going to plug into that formula that we just established that sum identity so i know x is equal to again sine of u cosine pi over six plus cosine u sine pi over six same thing it was on the end of the last slide plug in all right x is equal to the square root of one minus x squared times the square root of three over two, and then plus cosine of u is just x over one again. So x times one half. Just plugging in there and I'm gonna solve for x. Now it's just an algebraic equation. All right, so all of that to get to this point and then we'll just solve for x from here. Makes sense. We'll go through the rest of it, but to get to this point, because that's the trick part. There was some crazy stuff to figure out that we were in the first quadrant, but that was a lot of what we did to begin with. Make sure we get the fact that our substitution is u is our cosine of x gives us this triangle, helps us solve for sine of u and cosine of u. So the original problem with the equal part being pi over 6, that wouldn't give us the, the quadrant? Uh, no, because of the, the difference, of, because we have both the arc sine of x and cosine, arc cosine of x, it doesn't necessarily guarantee that it's in one. Yeah, because we have the two different ones. So we can't, 
yeah, we can't say it's in the first quadrant necessarily from the beginning until we solve for it. All right, multiply everything by two to kind of get rid of the fractions. I'll have two X is equal to um, the square root of three times the square root of one minus X squared and then plus X. All right? Square, or sorry, subtract the X from both sides before we square it because that makes it way, way easier. So I'll get that x is equal to the square root of 3 times square root of 1 minus x squared. And I'm still trying to solve. I mean, I've, I've solved for x technically, but I've solved for it in terms of x. We can't really have that. So I'm going to square both sides so that this x term that's underneath the radical, I, I don't have to worry about the square root anymore. So square both sides, I'm going to get x squared is equal to just 3 times 1 minus x squared. When I square the square root. Remember, if I square both sides here, if I was adding these two, the square root of 3 plus that square root of 1 minus x squared, I'd have to FOIL it out. Since they're being multiplied together, I can just square the first one and square the second one. Again, they have to be multiplied or divided for me to do each one individually like that. That just gives me 3 times 1 minus x squared. Multiply that out. It's 3 minus 3x squared. Add 3x squared to both sides. And I get 4x squared is equal to 3. All right? Divide both sides by 4 and take the square roots. And I know when I take the square roots that technically I should have so at 5 by 4, I, I'll get the square root of 3 over 2. Technically, it'd be plus or minus the square root of 3 over 2. Which one of those am I going to use? I agree. So my answer would be x is equal to plus or minus the square root of 3 over 2. Which one do I use? Yeah, yeah it's positive because I know that x has got to be bigger than 0. It's in that first quadrant there. All right, and that's it. All I need to do is check that just in case when we squared both sides earlier, it created a solution that didn't work. So plug in square root of three over two into the original equation. Remember arc sine of X minus arc cosine of X equal to pi over six. So plug in square root of three over two, I'm looking at arc sine of square root of three over two minus arc cosine square root of three over two and we're checking to see if that's equal to pi over six. So pi over three, arc sine of square root of three over two is gonna give me pi over three. When is sine equal to square root of three over two? It's gotta be in the first quadrant. So pi over three, when is cosine equal to square root of three over two? At pi over six. So pi over three minus pi over six is in fact equal to pi over six. <laughs> and our solution set <laughs> is square root of 3 over 2. Almost made it to the end without doing that. I got just one last sentence and I missed it. All right, so square root of 3 over 2 for that. No, there was a lot to that last problem. This is it. That's the, that's the last example. So a lot to that last problem. The main first part, I, I, over, I probably over-explained that but it's just to make sure we know which quadrant we're, that our, our angle is going to be in so that we can set up this triangle correctly. I can either set it up in the first quadrant or I can set it up in the, the second quadrant. Remember we had arc cosine of, of u, or sorry, u is equal to arc cosine of x. So it could be first or second. I wanna do all of the stuff that we did you know, here, all of this stuff, all of this stuff, that we made sure it was in the first quadrant instead of the second quadrant, all right? Or the first quadrant instead of the fourth quadrant if we were dealing with arc sine. So we're just trying to make sure all that stuff that was over explained to begin with, make sure we know where our quadrant is and then I can set up the triangle based on our other assumptions, all right? Don't forget to check the answer just in case. It is certainly possible that, you know, square root of three over two doesn't work and there's no solution. It's possible that happens. So always check, even if there's only one solution that we find, 
doesn't necessarily mean it works in the original equation. All right, that's it for 6.4. That's actually it for chapter six. So starting on Friday, we'll start with chapter seven.